Uh, this presentation draws heavily from the, uh, as, I, as uh, Dr. Shar has mentioned, the, the work that we did on the digital divide. And it is a uh, work that I, I did with uh, Mr. Silvin Calizo and uh, Maureen Rosellion. So in the next slide, let me first present uh, a framework to help us understand the relationship between the digital divide and the digital platform. And I present here the framework of Van Dyke, which I also tweak a little bit. So looking at the technology landscape, we seem to be in between the development of ICT and the next innovation, which may be manifesting itself as digital platforms. As such, we perceive digital divide that is caused by and related to the current state of technology or, the I, or ICT. But we are also starting to perceive some of the new manifestations of what I call a platform divide. Van Dyke distinguishes four kinds of barriers to access corresponding e to each of the four types of access. Motivational or mental access divide is driven by the lack of elementary digital experience, technology anxiety, and the unattractiveness or unfriendliness of new technology. Other factors that may contribute to motivational or mental access divide include low levels of income, low levels of education, and even the lack of time, as Gobadi in 2013 uh, mentioned. The second type of barrier includes those that limit physical access to a computer, a mobile phone, or even to a network connection. This would include the cost of internet subscriptions and mobile phone accounts, similar and similar to the mental access divide, low levels of income, low levels of education, and absence of even absence of occupation may contribute to this barrier. Skills access divide is divided into three types. The first is the operational skills or the capacity to work with hardware and software. The second is informational skills, which are, or include the skills to search, select, and process information in the computer and the network sources. And third is the strategic skills, which includes capacities to use computer and network sources as the means for a particular goal, such as earning a living or uh, in, ge in general, improving your position in society. Skills access is limited by the insufficient digital skills caused by lack of user friendliness of the technology, inadequate education, or social support. Gobadi 2013 points out that really education is the foundation critical of critically affecting all three types of skills. Usage access is the differential use of ICT applications in everyday, in everyday life, and this could include both the actual use of the ICT as well as the active versus passive use of ICT. Active and, or creative use of ICT is about the contributions to the internet, for instance, publishing a personal website, creating a web blog, posting a contribution on an online bulletin board, news group, or community, while passive would just include absorbing information. Usage is, la is largely linked to demographic characteristics of users and technical connections, such as your, your social class, your education, your age, gender, and even the effectiveness of your network connections. So Van Dyke's model suggests that when the full process of technology appropriation is completed, a new innovation comes up and the entire process again repeats. So usage access enables people to maximize the use of the current technology, and in this case, ICT, which may lead to the development and use of new innovations and then usage opportunities become more enhanced in the discovery and the use of more complex applications and innovations and this would include the platform economy so guiding now guiding us now here this framework let me just present um some barriers some some examples of the for instance uh, motivational access which refers to to the in the next slide, um, motivational access refers to the desire to have a computer or a mobile phone and be connected to the internet. And this desire is affected by social, cultural, or psychological factors. One of the main barriers for accessing the internet would be not knowing what it is and what it can do. And in a survey conducted by Wu et al. in 2016, in 11 countries from 2014 to 2015, it was found that over two-thirds of those currently offline did not know what the internet is. And for instance, only 13, 11, and 5% knew what the internet is in Thailand, Indonesia, and India, respectively. So in the next slide, let's talk about the Philippine case. 
those who are aware of the importance of the internet and perceive that it is important would have already hurdled a significant barrier to internet use. For the case of the Philippines, motivational barriers to internet use include awareness, interest and trust, and security issues. This is revealed by the results of the ICT survey conducted by the DICT. While the most common barriers would be related to cost and availability, there is still a considerable number of people who mentioned first not knowing about the internet, 11.4%, um, perception that there would be no useful or interesting content on the internet, 12.7%, and security issues, 3.77%, as barriers to their use of the internet. So now let us look at the other indicators um, of digital divide in Asia to see certain patterns of the population having better access to computers and the internet. Data from the ITU statistics database in the next slide and then another slide. All right, uh, could you move back one slide please? So data from the ITU statistics database or more recent data is available for 2019 shows that the developed countries outperform the developing countries and LDCs in a number of ICT access indicators such as mobile, that mobile phone, internet use, and broadband subscriptions. This pattern of more affluent areas having better access is also reflected within countries. The upper left-hand figure shows that the computer ownership in Singapore is higher for those living in private housing than those who live in public housing. Only about 86% of those living in public housing own computers, while the proportion is 97% for those who live in private housing. As private housing in Singapore is dominated by higher income Singapore citizens, expatriates, private investors, this discrepancy in access may be an indication of the role of income as a determinant in computer ownership and internet access. The case of Sri Lanka looks at the skills in computer and digital technology. Computer literacy and digital literacy is significantly higher for those living in urban areas. For 2018, 40.4% of those living in urban areas is considered computer literate, while for those living in rural areas, the proportion is only 27%. Much lower than this would be those living in estate areas, in which only 10.8% is digitally literate. This is consistent with the case of Singapore, which relates richer or more affluent areas to better internet access. So in the next slide, we see that data for a number of countries also show all right, data for Singapore shows that 96% of those who are 15 to 34 per, who are aged 15 to 34 in 2018 have individual computer usage. And in contrast, the proportion is only 33% for those who are 60 years old and above. So this is an indication that there's better digital access for those who are not so old and not so young. So there's essentially in the middle. For South Korea, the pattern for mobile internet usage is almost similar, although the peak is much wider. So it's around 20 to 49 years old. Also, those 60 to 69 years old still has a much higher mobile internet use, but the statistic is significantly lower for 70 years old and above. The discrepancy in access by age groups is not only for material access, but also in terms of skills, as exemplified by the case of Sri Lanka. Those who are computer or digital literate is highest among 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 years old. The younger age groups are from 5 years old to 14 years old, and the older age groups from about 50 years old to 70 years old have smaller proportions and following very similar patterns to Singapore and Korea. Similarly, the pattern is, uh, very fo is followed very closely by China. Internet users are mostly around 20 to 13, 20 to 29 years old or 30 to 39 years old. The age group with the lowest proportion would be those below 10 years old and those above 60 years old. And then in terms of gender, we find that ICT access is commonly better for males than females. Data for a number of countries also show that ICT access is commonly better for males than females. The data on internet users for India and China show that internet users are mostly male. 
and not only ICT access is higher for males, data for Sri Lanka also shows that females have lower computer and digital literacy than males. But for the Philippines, this is an is is not the same. The Philippine case is actually the females that have better access to the internet. In terms of skills divide, data for the Philippines shows that the more highly skilled segments of the population, the college, the high school, and those who are um, vocational, um, have education, but vocational, tend to use the computers for more productive or advanced tasks. Interestingly, the least advanced tasks, such as entertainment and gaming related activities, would have high participation of both skilled and unskilled segments. But while the task involving data management and analysis, modeling and simulation, would involve only those that are highly skilled segments of the population. So these segments, uh, in the next slide, let me just try to sum things up. So these segments are also the ones that are more likely to benefit in the platform economy. So what are these segments? Those that are living in affluent areas, those who are aware, uh, could you move back? Those who are aware of, um, more aware of the internet and perceive its usefulness, those who are not too young or not too old, and those who are male. These are the ones who are more likely to benefit from the platform economy, mainly because of the, the they are able to um, surpass the barriers of access, all uh, four types of barriers. So now let's look at um, examples. So the, and these segments are most more likely to benefit from the platform economy. So let's look at the next slide. So looking at the motivational barriers to trust, we look at the relationship of e-commerce and corruption. Corruption tends to breed distrust in the policy environment, and such distrust may affect the use of the digital technology to undertake e-commerce transactions. The platform economy is largely associated with digital transactions in e-commerce. And we find here that the figure shows that the country is associated with low incidence of corruption, for instance, Singapore, Japan, Switzerland, Israel, these are associated with higher rank in the e-commerce index, so more likely to have um, e-commerce transactions. In the next slide, we show that the participation in digital platforms, again, is more common to the not so young or not so old, similar to the what we have seen in terms of access to ICT. And this can and this pattern can be seen in, in a number of countries like China, Japan, India, Canada, Philippines, and even Taiwan. What is interesting would be for the Philippines, well, online shoppers are highest for around the 18 to 24 years old. There are on, these are only the second largest online shopping group. It's actually the 25 to 34 years old that uh, per, is the highest. The, per, and this is perhaps because that this is the group that is earning more relative to the 18 to 24 years old. Another interesting case would be the case of Japan, which shows that there are platform activities in which the younger generations participate in, such as the video sharing and uploading. Of, and But these are activities that really don't cost any money. These are activities that would involve uh, less monetary transactions. The activities that would involve monetary transactions would be higher among those that are already working. Again, an indication that maybe income is a, is a determinant of the use of digital platforms. As shown in the earlier figures, those who are more educated also tend to use computers for more advanced tasks. And uh, again, exemplifying uh, in the next slide, we want to show that the digital skills are important to maximize the use of the digital economy. So more technological skills is positively associated with the use of advanced with advanced tasks undertaken by firms. There is a positive correlation of having digital technological skills of the economy with the use of big data and analytics and the digital transformation of, of companies. And this is important for countries to support the adoption of firms of the digital technology and participation in the platform economy. So in the next slide, we, are, we just want to show that we, if we are going to look at digital transactions, which again is a foundation for the participation in the platform economy, we find discrepancies among different um, uh, sectors. So for example, in Japan, we see the comparison between men and women, we see a comparison between those who are in labor and out of the labor force. And for China, we see a comparison here of between uh, educational attainment and see that um, again, 
very specific um, segments have a better par participation or access to uh, the digital transactions. Furthermore, we see that often males tend to participate more because males tend to have better access to ICT and uh, other um, issues related to access. This is translated to un some unequal patterns of access to digital platforms that uh, can be seen when you compare uh, the access of males and females. This is evident in the use of the online shopping platform, for example, in Netherlands and um, e-commerce in China. So not only in terms of e-commerce and online shopping, uh, uh, could you move to the next slide, please? All right. So we, what we want to see here is that uh, if we look at the middle uh, figure, we see that for South Korea, um, ride hailing services is relatively unequal for the less popular mobile apps in South Korea. While females typically use the two most popular apps, the males actually have better or more choices. They are the ones who are using also the less popular apps, maybe because this is an issue of security, issue of a better access, and a better of um, more trust in the other uh, apps. Again, putting the females in uh, a disadvantageous uh, position. All right, so in the next slide, let us talk about other um, issues. So we're looking at uh, digital transactions, but let us see about the case of e-learning. So what we have here is we looked at the uh, TESDA online program or the top. So the map shows that 16.5% of the TESDA online program registered users are residing in low HDI areas and 2.69% of the users are in severely poor communities. The location of the 4,018 users that we were able to survey were overlaid with a map of the Human Development Index performance for each province in the country. And it shows that the correlation of users is higher in areas in which are relatively richer or more developed. Data also shows that the better skilled have better access. Usually the college undergraduates or the college graduates would register to the test the online program. Looking for at the case for other countries, we have found that the same patterns are, exist in terms of age. It is indeed those who are 18 to 44, again, the not so young and not so old, who are accessing e-learning in Vietnam. We also see similar patterns for um, in terms of age, but um, I, I didn't uh, show it here anymore. How about uh, digital health, mHealth, mobile health? Mobile health is defined as the use of mobile services, such as mobile phones, um, uh, patient monitoring devices, personal digital assistants, and wireless devices for medical and public health practice. Examples of mHealth applications provided in the survey conducted in 2015 by the GOE um, covered a broad spectrum of telephone helplines, text message appointment reminders, to mobile telehealth and mobile access to electronic patient information. So mHealth, Global Diffusion of eHealth, can contribute to achieving um, universal health care services and through making services available to remote populations and underserved communities and providing mechanisms for data exchange on patients and services. And it can be used to increase access to provision of health services in areas where there is little infrastructure to support internet or traditional health services. So what we find here is that, uh, could you move to the next slide I'm on mobile health? All right, so for mobile health, high income countries have more mobile health programs than low income countries. And this would include services such as providing information, collecting healthcare information, and providing health services. Again, we, we find here is that the more affluent areas tend to participate more in the digital economy and not just in the digital and the financial transactions, but also in terms of he, uh, education and health. So in the next slide, what I want to also emphasize is that platforms are also facing their own issues related to usage divide. And that is what the model of Van Dyke has already, is already saying. So in the next slide, let me just um, try to show you who, what, who would er, probably earn more from Airbnb or the accommodation platforms. We can observe there that there's a concentration of Airbnb postings in the central districts and in the busy areas in Seoul and Singapore. And the same can be observed for Sri Lanka. Areas in the periphery, while having some Airbnb postings, do not enjoy the scale that is observed in the central districts. 
And it seems that there's a divide from those who have assets that have access to central districts and those that have assets that are from nearby districts and those that are um, far away from the, the tourist spots or the, the areas of interest. Second, what we also see is that crowd workers tend to be well-educated. Within crowd platforms, there is an indication that the well-educated tend to participate more. And it's actually found here in an earlier study by the ILO. Next, we what we also find as another uh, indication of some platform divide is that um, usage divide could be seen in how Americans earn from digital platforms. Uh, a study by J.P. Morgan Chase shows that those who are able to earn more from digital platforms are those who have assets which can be rented out to earn supplemental income. And this is in contrast to people who work in labor platforms, which do so in order to offset their monthly earnings. Next, let me, let's just look at them, uh, a special type of user. So there are types of users in the next slide. Uh, I want to show up, uh, indirect users of digital platforms. Cuts International in 2018 conducted a study on digital platforms in India. And based on their survey, 48% of respondents were aware that digital platforms can be used to transfer money to others. 37% are aware that can be used to make utility and tax payments, and 39% are aware that can be used to purchase goods and services. However, of those who are aware that the use of, of the uses of digital payments, only 25% actually make use of it, while some of those who do not use it, 13% actually use digital payments with the help of others. So these are what we call indirect users. And this reflects the limited capacity and trust of some consumers on using digital payment services themselves, which shows that digital platforms may face a motivational access barrier. So let me just summarize three key takeaways in the next slide. Digital divide can be seen as a determinant of the use of digital platforms as barriers to material access, motivational and skills access affect how digital platforms will be used and maximized. Platforms also face their own issues related to the usage divide, which may contribute to higher levels of inequality. And so policy interventions should address not only the provision of material access, but also addressing other forms of divide. And in the next two slides, I, let me just try to provide some policy recommendations. So in the next slide, we, I provide here some policy recommendations um, addressing three different the three different types of access, motivational, materials, and skills. Countries in the region have been tracking the performance of digital usage in terms of material access to the internet, computers, and mobile phone, but there is limited information in terms of participation in the digital platforms and the other factors necessary to participate in these. There should be moves to increase trust in the use of digital platforms. And together with this, there should be programs to increase the capability of consumers to make use of digital platforms in everyday life. And businesses should have the opportunity and capability to make use of digital platforms to expand their markets and meet the demands of consumers. The experience of many countries and even the Philippines with the use of digital technology in the COVID-19 pandemic shows that while internet access and having a mobile phone is necessary condition, to participate in the platform economy, it's not sufficient. Other factors are also equally important and need to be addressed. Finally, let because of the special cases that I have shown, example for e-commerce and M health, mobile health, and e-learning, let me just provide some policy recommendations addressing um, issues for each. So for example, for e-commerce, we want to reduce the regulatory burden for businesses and obtain the trust of consumers by handholding on the use of the platforms and increasing data security to address the concerns of those who are afraid of, um, of taking the risk of using uh, digital platforms, and digital payments. For, for e-health or m-health, improving policy environments surrounding e-health, which would include the use of digital appointments, digital data collection, and e-prescriptions, there is a need to increase awareness from both doctors and consumers on telemedicine. And finally, for e-learning, we want to provide a less expensive me means of participating in e-learning and also to involve both the public and the private sector in the important formulation of modules, as this can also uh, provide uh, better opportunities and um, more uh, options for participating in e-learning. So I think this is my last slide, and I thank you all for um, the opportunity again to present. Thank you.